Welcome. Uh, what better way to spend a rainy night than together? Um, welcome to faces I know and to those I don't. Uh, my name is Jeremy, um, Jeremy Cohen. I'm a sociologist and the director of the Honors Program here at SDA. Um, and I just have a few words to welcome you here tonight, and then I will turn it over to our speaker. So let me just say a few words of introduction to the series. Uh, this is the Art and Politics Lecture Series. It is co-sponsored by the Honors Program and the Visual and Critical Studies Program, shared by Tom Kuhn over there. Um, and I thought I would just read a little bit um, of our description, just to kind of have it in mind, kind of what it's for, why we're all here. Um, the, the Art and Politics Lecture Series, you know, uh, Habermas in an essay called The Idea of the University says that universities should be about, on the one hand, you know, scholarship and learning, on the other hand, uh, also educating students, on the other hand, also educating the general public and increasing the general enlightenment. Nobody really believes in the general enlightenment anymore. Again, that's another ship that I think has sailed. But, uh, <laughs> you know, we still live in the shadow of those grand ideals, which many of you are studying in your classes uh, as we speak. So that is part of the purpose of this lecture series. Let me just read the description to get a little more into the content. Um, humanity is living through an interlocking series of crises. It is difficult to say strongly how enough, how urgent the situation is. How do these conditions impact the arts? Does art have resources that might come to our aid in these serious times? What is to be done? In light of all there is to understand and to change, SDA's Art and Politics Lecture Series, co-hosted by Visual and Critical Studies and the Honors Program, invites activists, scholars, politicians, artists, critics, historians, curators, and scientists, and more to address, discuss, and debate politics, art, and the delicate filaments that tie them together. That's our lecture series. Um, and this first event, I'm really excited to be kicking off um, numero uno for the year. Uh, it is in conjunction with the exhibition in the Flatiron Project space, a sticker history, a snapshot from 100 years of design told through adhesive materials. Um, and you should make sure if you haven't gotten to take a look yet, it is um, right in that little corner um, over, uh, you can see it from outside as well, the window and the video you're seeing is also up in the exhibition and features some of the stickers kind of brought together in this exhibition. Also notable uh, sticker work by many artists, including Cause, Andy Warhol, there's a long list, um, uh, uh, Keith Haring, Mary Minter, et cetera. So take a look if you haven't um, I wanted to uh, say, unfortunately, um, sad news before we also kick off. Um, the curator of that exhibition, D.B. Berkman, who was supposed to join us um, as part of the event tonight, is stuck, uh, was not able to get lift off on a plane, is in Miami at the moment. Um, uh, so alas, he will not be here to join us. Um, you should, I'll, after the event, maybe send around an essay of his, just because he's pretty cool and has a lot to say about the history of stickers, um, sort of a ton to say, uh, and I really, it's evident in his handiwork and his curation of the exhib exhibition. Um, however, with that piece of unfortunate news, um, we have some very awesome news and wonderful news, which is that Carla McCormick is here with us tonight. Uh, by way of a brief introduction, um, I'm just going to read actually the description that DB wrote of Carlo because I thought it was uh, wonderfully charming. And uh, Carlo, feel free to fill in more than yeah. that. Um, but uh, Carlo is a cultural critic, the former senior editor of Paper Magazine, longtime museum curator for all things pop culture, and superstar in the NYC downtown art scene, um, as well as a teacher of many years and, and more. So, um, without further ado, I am going to turn it over to Carlo. Oh, very last thing. For some of you, it's your first lecture. Feel free to kind of let questions percolate in your head. These things work best when people, um, after the speaker gives their remarks, people are ready to like engage in a discussion. So take some notes, think of some questions, be ready to engage a little bit. Um, please don't fall asleep. If you feel yourself fall asleep, you know, get those lights going. Not because of Carlo, but just because it's, you know, raining outside and 6.45. So, um, without further ado, uh, I turn it over to Carlo. Uh, let's give him a round of applause, please. Uh, uh, thanks, Jeremy, and thanks to 
SVA for hosting uh, something which kind of probably falls outside the purview of a lot of ac uh, academic discourse these days. Um, and thanks to all of you for coming. Uh, the, uh, I'm really sorry DB's not here. He's one of these obsessive compulsive guys. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, he, he wanted me to tell you that he's a recovering addict so all he thinks about is stickers and, and his collection. So he really would have gotten in on the, in the weeds with you and uh, really gone down the rabbit hole. I'm more of a generalist. Uh, um, uh, but uh, a long time uh, fan of stickers. Uh, let's think a little bit uh, about the history first. Uh, um, it has a kind of prehistory with the decollage, the decoupé movement in France. Artists like, you know, Max Ernst and people like that were working, and it was a transfer thing based in ceramics, as I remember. Uh, Maybe there's a better art historian that can correct me on that. A lot of that stuff would work with um, something which was really big back then, which were these kind of artist books, which were largely generated by poets and avant-garde writers. And the visual artists were intimately, uh, you know, Max telling me about like how, you know, how much that mattered to him is a, a favorite part of his work. Um, and then uh, there's kind of an evolution of the medium, which is really tedious, and thank God I can't put dates to it. But uh, a lot of it, we would think of like uh, the sticker would have originally been the gum back that you would lick, or you know, it would be wet, and then it would be put on. Uh, and then uh, uh, one of the other big evolutions is the die cut print. Uh, so. Originally, a sticker would be a block of something, and then all of a sudden, you could get shapes. Uh, the first stickers I remember, uh, kind of early 60s, uh, Chiquita Banana, uh, used to, I think they probably still do. And it had a weird uh, ripple effect on kids. We kind of like took them off the bananas and stuck them places. And, and I think Chiquita figured it out because sometime in the 70s, they started doing it like in conjunction with the NFL and you would have like your favorite team sticker on there, but uh, you know, less good graphics, <laughs> shall we say. Uh, the, the Chiquita lady, as she was called, is probably a little more problematic uh, as a kind of a tropical exotic. and. Um, and they redesigned it like the way Starbucks had to redesign their woman. But that was kind of the, the first I remember. Um, uh, I think that's like early 60s is when they started that. And it just, I think it keeps going. Um, Panini, a uh, big bread company, they did something around 70. I think it's 1970 because the FIFA World Cup. And that was the idea of you would collect these stickers but then you'd have the album for it, which kind of fed into like, well, I was gonna so, throw so many obscure old, you have to be old references, but there used to be something called green stamps, which you'd get at the supermarket. <laughs> yeah, I, I knew you'd be the one who got it. <laughs> uh, so it kind of uh, kind of fit in on that. And then uh, DB's collection, uh, which is really epic, and you're just getting a fraction of it here. Um, has been really uh, centered on artists done stickers. So ignoring the fact that like, you know, when I was a kid in cereal boxes, you might get like Jackson 5 stickers or something like that. You, would, you know, uh, the idea that cereals always had a, a free toy and stuff like that. Um, and trading cards were a big thing of, of stickers. Um, and that created in 1967, the first version of Wacky Packages. And this was created by this guy, Art Spiegelman. I don't know how many of you are familiar with Art's work. Um, he did an incredible book called Mouse, uh, which was uh, a graphic novel. He came out of comics, and it, but it was like, wow, that's a really literate, he ended up winning the Pulitzer Prize for a really literate comic about um, about the Holocaust and art is what we used to call growing up in New York, the survivor of survivors, which meant that his parents uh, survived the concentration camps and 
the kids survive the parents. Um, <laughs> but uh, art, uh, uh, he became the art director for that. And then like in 73, okay, so the first ones were like lick off and they, you know, they didn't go that far. But then I think around 73 and it ran for a good five years and it's been brought back at different times. Uh, uh, with with, with uh, the die cut and the sticker, these wacky packages. Now, wacky packages were very... Okay, so he worked with a lot of artists. Uh, I wrote some names down because... Well, Bill Griffith did Zippy the Pinhead. He wouldn't have been here, but I believe, if I'm not mistaken, if there's anyone here with institutional knowledge, they can correct me, but Kim Deitch, Drew Friedman, and Mark Newgarden, who all, are all like really famous in that world and are all SVA teachers or maybe Kim's emeritus now, but I think, we, do you know? I don't know. That's that uh, illustration department. Um, but uh, so it was a total spoof. It was kind of coming out of something which really radically changed American culture, which was called Mad Magazine, which started coming out in the 50s. And they started spoofing everything. And literally America had... I mean, we had things like the word nasty comes from Thomas Nast, who actually um, did really uh, nasty cartoons about all the political leaders in New York. Um, and so, you know, we did have a history of caricature and, and satire, but never really laughing at ourselves and never really laughing at the status quo. So Mad really changed everything. And I remember Bill Gaines, the publisher, being at his memorial service, and it was like everyone from... Terry Gilliam, who had a company called Monty Python, uh, became a famous uh, artist, filmmaker himself, um, talking about how like when they formed in the late 50s, and they were really radical at that time, English comedy troupe, that like Mad was the only thing they could look at to Gloria Steinem, who's like one of the founders of uh, the feminist movement, had a little magazine called Ms. Magazine, which was super important uh, in the early 70s, saying by mad making us laugh at ourselves allowed us to start questioning things. So uh, Wacky Packages very much came out of that, and it's interesting because it is making fun of basically consumer culture. And um, so, uh, it, you know, imagine some serial, you know, I don't know. I, I, sh I should have written down some of the, you know, it was funny and irreverent. And that was a, a really a huge thing for uh, the idea that uh, this could be a canvas, that the artists could work in this way, the same way they'd worked in something like comics or eventually in T-shirts or now basically with co-branding and just about any product you can possibly imagine. Um, okay, so uh, let me try to, I don't know if this is a very chronological history. I would say that probably punk uh, uh, as, a, as a music, not just as a bunch of delinquent kids, but as a, as a kind of musical mo movement that emerged in the 70s, grabbed onto it a lot. And uh, one of the significant figures from that, and I'm pretty sure he's in the show, is this guy, Jamie Reed. And Jamie Reed was, came out of the situationist movement. And that's kind of why I put an extra minute talking about a uh, stupid collectible from uh, so long before you were born with wacky packages. But basically uh, the situationists had this idea of detournement. And um, uh, it's kind of a way of changing signs, a, a way of, of, uh, of altering the pre-existing in a subversive way or in a way that maybe expresses a truth behind the advertising lie, behind the packaging lie. And uh, I, I would have, uh, if, if I'd thought of it, I would have said that the reason DB, uh, who's really the, the maestro behind this can't be here is because his uh, old lady, the, the queen, got to bury this morning, and he's too very clumped from the situation. But uh, DB does go back to the punk era uh, amongst his his really tawdry uh, backstories that he was uh, good friends with uh, Sid Vicious. So uh, God save the queen of fascist regime, regime, as the Sex Pistols would say. But that was the kind of um, the play that was going on there, the uh, kill your idols uh, 
attitude of it. And so it does have some roots in music. It doesn't become a super common currency. It picks up steam. A, a lot of these things will be driven as a lot of, you know, like from the first video cameras that artists get, these things are trickle down. Uh, or artists who used to work in Super 8 film before that, is that basically things exist in our culture in either a, a high-end way or a novelty way, and then they sort of become more accessible and artists gravitate towards them as a way of getting their work out, usually in more serial and more populist ways. So one of the, th you know, I remember as a kid, like, we used to call them Xerox machines, but these kind of copy machines are now they're scanners or whatever they, however they function, something uh, digital and sophisticated beyond my analog mind. But those became a really huge uh, tool for artists. Uh, at the uh, uh, Art Institute of Chicago, they used to have, you could used to be able to get a degree in the 70s in, in Xerox art. Uh, and I remember like a lot of, there was this, you know, one of the earliest ones in New York was called Todd's Coffee Shop. And that's like where Kim Gordon from Sonic Youth worked there and Thurston Moore from <laughs> before they had the band, he'd go there to do his zine. So zine culture was a big thing. This idea that, uh, I mean, uh, it's hard to explain these things before the internet, but I'm sure you've been told enough to know about the dark ages that way. But communication, uh, you know, uh, we kind of evolved from smoke signals and, uh, and this was a big leap. And um, so with Xerox, uh, a lot of artists could get a hold of that and then people could Xerox on adhesive paper. And so you get an artist like Shepard Ferry, who's now, you know, really sophisticated silkscreen prints and has a, a pretty nice career with his paintings. Um, but he starts as an art student at uh, RISD and uh, he's creating kind of the empty signifier. The thing that you, when you see it, you're, you're kind of like, oh, great. Like, that's so cool. What do I need to buy now? And of course, it was no, there was no object for sale. There was no ideology, uh, anything. It was like Andre the Giant has a posse. And, uh, and so that it was like a real semiotic trick uh, he learned. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, and, and in the end, like if, you, if you're not familiar with him, he's pretty good at branding because he's the guy who does the Obama Hope uh, poster, which was a, a real game changer. Um, unfortunately, a temporary one, as most things in politics are. Uh, so it's really coming out of this uh, DIY culture and the people who picked up most on the legacy of punk rock, if I can use an adjective like most, I'm not sure, uh, it's debatable, but would be skate culture. And even though I'm like kind of hip to all this stuff, uh, as somebody who's uh, hopelessly addicted to uh, all the effluvium of uh, youth culture. Uh, it's really with uh, skate culture that I got really intrigued. There was a gallery in New York called Legend Gallery on Ludlow Street back in the day, and they did a sticker show. And I had no idea how huge it'd become. This would be like early 90s. And that's sort of like when I was like, oh, cool. Like, I like stickers. I'm a writer, like most writers, we have to have a, a notebook. And so every notebook I have is always covered with like, stickers uh yeah it, you know uh but that was a generation of artists that like if you ever see the movie beautiful losers kind of captures it it's like people like the gons mark gonzalez ed templeton you know thomas campbell whatever margaret kilgowan barry mcgee who was known by graffiti named twist um and they all started making stickers and they started really making them not like just as throw offs. They started really um, investing creatively in them. So I think that was really important. Uh, it kind of goes through. There was a big thing in mid 2000s, maybe late like 2009 or something, the, a big thing down in DC because DC had this hardcore uh, thing and this history of stickers and they did like the first international sticker convention. First and only, no doubt. Um, 
but the, but uh, it, it, all those things were in there. That was at the fridge gallery. The uh, so if we think of of its roots coming from skate and punk, that gives us. I think that's enough common history in these things that it should give most of us an idea of the energies uh, that were manifest then, um, which were pretty white, pretty male. Uh, it evolves from there, but we have to acknowledge that that's kind of part of that history. Um, uh, because uh, there was a moment um, by the 90s when a generation of hip hop artists uh, kind of converged with a generation of uh, kind of punk artists. And um, uh, a lot of that energy transferred there. So you have like early things like Run DMC and Public Enemy, the one Hayes helped design with the figure in the gun sight. Um, I don't know how much people know about old hip hop. So that crossed over, but uh, I'd say it's like, I wrote it down because I'm so bad with dates. 83 was uh, Santa Cruz Skateboards. Uh, they had this great logo, this guy Jim Phillips did, which was called the Screaming Hand. And it was like, even if you don't know it, you'd recognize it. It's kind of burnt in there like, like Pokemon, which also did great, great stickers. You know, <laughs> you know as good as Hello Kitty and My Little Pony, really like, you know, top notch it. Um, but uh, so, and that kind of busted it open. And so what we're thinking about there is a kind of form of branding. And what really ties into it is the same thing uh, that uh, was, uh, had its genesis, uh, well, it has its genesis beforehand, had, had a moment through punk had a moment through, certainly through hip hop, uh, had kind of, well, basically it's as old as language. Now that we're finding old places like Pompeii and Situ, we realize that graffiti has been around for a really long time. Now, when we talk about graffiti, we think very much about birth of style as happened in Philadelphia and New York, where lettering got really sophisticated and you end up with wild style and things like that. But uh, as long as there've been people who have not had their voice um, or their selves represented in our society, uh, they've spoken out. And they've usually done it by writing something on the wall, be it their name or that the mayor is a, a you know, the bloody bastard. Um, so uh, graffiti was, was really important in this. And graffiti artists were very much early arrivers on it. Um, the it's an easier way of getting up to like literally, and I have friends, I walk down the street with them. I'm like, and I'm really slow. I got a cane. Like most people complain, but they're stopping every two feet and throwing up a sticker. So it kind of works out fine. I just keep going and they, they catch up. But, but, you know, cause if you're a kid getting caught with spray cans or a marker is, you know, is actually a crime. Uh, you can pretend that you're using the Rust-Oleum to fix your dad's barbecue or something, but they're not going to believe you. So uh, it just, just possession is already a crime. And uh, it takes time to put your tag up versus uh, the things that, you know, because graffiti artists, uh, by a matter of principle, do not uh, uh, pay for their materials. <laughs> it's, all, it's all about what you can boost. Uh, so, uh, the two forms were the, uh, hello, my name is, you ever been at like those horrible parties where they make you wear that shit? Anyway, those or like USPS stickers that you put on the outside of an envelope and they do their tag there and they, they put it up. So, uh, this is, um, yeah, so I, I won't get too held up on the history, but, uh, th that was another one, a little tangent on that is that that's very much hand done and there's a very uh, fam famous photographer named Martha Cooper who did this book Subway Art uh, which was the bible by which graffiti left New York like a an ugly meme and spread around the world the next thing you knew like if you're in Europe or Asia all these kids around the world who didn't even speak the same language were uh, finding a, a, a language a common language uh, for themselves 
And uh, Marty, uh, Martha um, had a huge sticker collection, you know, something that would have made DB really jealous. And then I remember this thing is like, no, she started saying no to people about their stickers. And I was like, wow, you know, <laughs> that's really rare for an obsessive collector. And she'd made a shift because all she cared about were the hand-drawn ones. Someone putting their tag on a piece of paper and slamping it on, slapping it on a lamppost or a stop sign or whatever like that. Uh, you can see, I mean, this is the stuff that uh, most people kind of tune out as just urban noise. Like you don't really listen to the melodics of a car horn or a truck downshifting. It's this urban noise, graffiti and street art and things like that. But if you see the show and once you're hip to it, and I think just as visual artists, you're going to be more attuned to anyone. It's pretty hard to walk down the street and not see this conversation going on uh, amongst all sorts of people across race, across class. It's really actually really interesting. And that's, uh, I've been an art critic for a really long time, but one of the first things I supported was, was were the graffiti writers, uh, especially the ones who really aspire to be fine artists instead of just, vandals and what struck me then uh and it has not been surpassed was this was really like the first uh open-ended field i knew where there were rich kids and poor kids they were from all all the boroughs uh, across race across uh, a lot of things um, in a way uh, that was it was exclusive because if you weren't a writer you were kind of not part of the culture um but uh really inclusive in a way that Sadly, the art world uh, is, is working really hard to correct, but I'm not sure it's entirely there yet. Um, the, as many things about graffiti uh, yeah, yeah, spawned so much of street art, um, a lot of the great street artists kind of started out as really bad graffiti writers like Banksy or something like that. His, his old work's really not very good. Um, and then they found a different visual language. And that's a, vi that's a visual language which is about imagery. And if you can say uh, graffiti is, is a very complicated form um, involving like real minutia uh, about like letter styles. I mean, it's just like if you hear them talk He's like so bored. <laughs> it's like the issues they have are like they make formalism in the art world look positively like uh, fun. Um, but uh, it was a hermetic language in its way uh, and really meant just for the kind of clued in for the aficionados and for the practitioners. Street art, of course, engages people in all sorts of different ways. It's cool stuff. And it goes back to a kind of moment that happened on the trains that we kind of called mascots and mugs, but that was where uh, graph became less about getting your name up there and about doing imagery that everyone could read. And um, it tied into things like Von Bodie, who was a king of underground comics, all sorts of uh, weird pop cultural stuff went there. It was inherently a pop form and inherently an appropriative form. And uh, those things are so pervasive in most forms of cultural production today, you can take it for granted. But if you keep that in mind and you look at like the kind of uh, some of the things. OK, so when Supreme, uh, when James opens that store, <laughs> he can't sell anything. You know, it's a place where every kid went to rip shit off. Um, so he, he, he creates a logo and he has finally, a, you know, no one's buying skateboards. He's got a t-shirt he can sell and it becomes a sticker. Well, that's inherently appropriate thing because he had like a kid doing art design for him and he gave him a, a Barbara Kruger book and said like, take a look at this and come up with something like it. And it is like totally like it's the same font, same kind of um, red and white, uh, you know, the same sort of... Uh, uh, fascist commercial uh, uh, ideas that, that Barbara was working with. Um, so, and then you see how many people ripped that off or you see how many people, you know, did their versions of Shepard's Obey stickers or his Hope stickers and stuff like that. So it be, it's, a, it's not just a conversation across individualities. It is a form of self-expression and you can do whatever you want with a sticker. I love the, that a bunch of students put together a sticker sheet out of here. I thought that was 
really great practice. I hope you stuck them all over the school and got someone fired. No, just kidding. Um, uh, but uh, it's also like a conversation across mediums. Uh, the way streetwear is, which was another early thing, because streetwear, basically a lot of people like Futura, whose mask I'm wearing, uh, <laughs> whatever. I think I branded out pretty good. This guy's the sticker in your window. Uh, this guy's like, I don't even, I don't really know his work. It's, uh, I think it's clown posse, but it's stickers all over town. And, and I think that's what makes him a street artist, it's just stickers, that's enough for him. He's not like doing murals or anything like that. Uh, and I got my Keith Haring socks, which uh, is really gonna, we'll have to do a separate two minute chapter on him because he's super important that way. But does anyone remember what I was talking about? Uh, oh, anyway, uh, yeah, so uh, as much as this thing about individuality, it is a conversation. So it's like call and response. And uh, there's a whole lot of appropriation, a whole lot of tweaking going on. And, uh, and streetwear uh, was a big part of that. That's what I was talking about was that a lot of these guys like Hayes, um, uh, people who were really, in, in the guy I said who did the Public Enemy logo, but he did a ton of stuff. He, uh, um, he was one of the first graphic designers of hip hop. And uh, then he got into streetwear. A lot of, a lot of people, early arrivers, are, were people who were coming from graffiti and there's no money in graffiti, right? And then all of a sudden you're like in your 30s or God forbid in your 40s and all you've got is something that can get you arrested. Um, so, you, you, and then, or you can like do really horrible commercial work for like Mountain Dew or some, you know, thing like that or kind of stuff on a movie set where they try to make it look like some inner city and it's all really toy and really horrible and you're really mistreated. So that was a way with that kind of DIY spirit, those people took hold of it. And then of course, out of that, they started doing stickers, but also the hang tag on clothes would be a sticker quite often. And that, that still continues. A lot of this stuff starts with Sean Stussy and goes through Supreme, but it was also very much like an organic cottage industry along with that. Um, so uh, that does bring me to Keith Haring because Keith really uh, did change the game when he opened the, well, even beforehand. Um, basically, uh, Keith wasn't stupid. By the way, uh, I should call him an alumnus of SVA. He didn't graduate, but I think the school gave him a degree just because he was such a cool <laughs> alumni to have. Um, uh, but, uh, uh, Keith was really smart. A lot of his work you will see is actually dealing with like the kind of stuff that most students were like Derrida or something like that. You know, the students are like, oh my God, I got to take a theory class and I got to do homework and I got to do reading and, and for artists, it's, it's miserable. Steve somehow, uh, Keith somehow processed all that stuff and he came up with a visual language. But part of his whole thing was like, he was trying to create incredibly democratic, form that would be accessible and affordable, which is entirely contrary to how the art world works. And I hope your teachers have told you that already. Um, and Keith had, you know, he had a lot of it, you know, all of us were going like, you know, dude, like it's supply demand. Like you're making a lot and you're giving it away for free, either through this kind of epic, really muscular thing he did for many years in the subways where uh, and when, a, when an ad uh, expired, because basically people would rent that advertising space on the subways, but when it expired, they'd just put black paper over it, so, so, you know. But there would be a lot of black paper because that was not, people riding the subways in the late 70s and early 80s in New York was not exactly it a demographic that <laughs> most people wanted to advertise to. Uh, so uh, there was a lot of that and he started doing these charcoal uh, uh, drawings on them. I don't know if you know that and Keith, you know, and famously said, you know, when people would be like, yeah, but you know, of course I'd like to be in MoMA like the rest of the artists, but I know way more people are seeing and appreciating my art than will ever walk into the Museum of Modern Art. Um, 
Of course, that was before MoMA became a huge tourist trap that fills the place pretty pretty well, or before like this high low thing got uh, got uh, relatively demolished um, or converged. But uh, there were a lot of people telling Keith, you know, like stop doing this cheesy commercial stuff. You're going to be the next Peter Max, um, uh, which might be before your time. How about? Thomas Kincaid, I don't know. There, you know, whatever, one of these artists who's kind of just known uh, for commercial work and never going to be taken seriously in the canon. Um, uh, and his, because he was making posters and like for there'd be like Rock Against Racism concert in Central Park. I remember like all of us having to roll up posters for Keith for two days so he could give them out for free. Uh, lots of things like that. Uh, any kid who came up, he'd do a drawing on his back or in their black book. Um, and everyone's going like, no, no man, you, you got to stop doing that. Like what you got to do is you, you know, you do a show in New York once a year, maybe, you know, if you're, if you really want to push it, maybe one in Asia, maybe one in Europe, you know, whatever, but you do like three shows a year. You do like 30 paintings, anything more than that's going to kill you. And whatever you do, stop giving away for free. So he opened the pop shop and he, uh, he made things really cheap, including stickers or refrigerator magnets, or mostly a big one was t-shirts. And t-shirts have a, God, you guys, I could just go on so many tangents. You want to know a little bit about how t-shirts became a canvas since we all look at each other's t-shirts and admire them. Um, so uh, t-shirts, okay, it's got a, like a little bit of a, a kind of a film history and that every man in America used to wear a t-shirt, but it was an undershirt. And then there was this really great movie, if you like to watch old black and light white movies on Turner Classic Movies like me, called It Happened One Night with, uh, oh, what was her name? Claudette Colbert, oh, yeah. yeah. I still got a crush on her. Uh, long dead, um, like most of my crushes. And uh, Clark Gable who was like kind of a sex symbol and he takes his shirt off and he's not wearing an undershirt which was pretty racy at that time but apparently t-shirt sales like fell out like no one bought a t-shirt for like another 10 years and and then they kind of come back in the 50s with this guy uh marlon brando who kind of had the wife beater which was you know so uh, i don't they weren't called wife beaters and we only really start calling them wife beaters when in a great form of cultural appropriation lesbians started wearing them. But you know, the sleeveless t-shirts like that. Um, and uh, that's like, uh, uh, and that made them sexy again. But the idea of putting actual imagery on t-shirts is much more recent than even that. And it starts uh, in the kind of early golden age of South Beach, the first set of like, resorts down there like when people like jackie gleason had resorts i'm sorry that's a really old reference um but anyway there were uh snowbirds is what you call them whatever all these people would come down from minneapolis or manhattan or whatever and they'd all fly down to florida in the middle of winter to give themselves a break and they'd get there and uh <laughs> they didn't really have good summer clothes for that stuff or they you know they didn't realize they sweat through three t-shirts a day. So they started selling t-shirts in the gift stores of these places. And there was this one great old like Jewish guy from the Bronx who was kind of the Shmata guy who was doing that stuff. And he put the Sands or whatever the name of the hotel was on it. And then he, he was like going to them, he goes like, you want to try to sell some other t-shirts? And he struck a deal with Disney. And of course, if you want to make money, strike a deal with the devil. And, um, uh, so he did a Mickey Mouse shirt, and that's in the 50s, and that exploded it, and that's the kind of beginning of it. And then it kind of goes through youth culture uh, in the 60s and things like that, and metal bands, uh, rock bands, uh, uh, stuff like that, because merch, you know, uh, for a lot of bands, that's still to this day, uh, especially now that no one buys records. It, it's the way you support a tour, is uh, you have something to sell at your little kiosk up front to, to get gas money for till the next town. Um, so anyway, Keith was the guy who kind of made people realize that a, a t-shirt could be a canvas. And you kind of know the history from there. I could fill in some things, but that was basically it. He gave permission. And this is a, a kind of 
important moment in art as well. And what I'd say, it's in the late 50s, this guy Jean Tanguy came up with this idea of the edition multiplique, by which we now have the term multiples. And we can think of a sticker as a multiple. Now, the original idea was a little more Duchampian. Uh, it was the idea that this would be uh, somehow not unique, but unique, that every, every piece would be uh, autonomous in and of itself, even though if there would be an addition of 10. It was really like trying to hold on to the preciousness of what the art object is, which is what the art market cares about. Um, if you look at that history of artist multiples, uh, the fluxus, think of Joseph Boys, uh, or in New York, George Machunis, uh, and like Yoko Ono did a beautiful one. She was a fluxus artist, which was called Box of Smiles, which was like this stainless steel box. And it just said Box of Smiles, and you opened it, and you'd see a reflection, and you'd smile. You know, so flux boxes, pop artists, of course. Warhol did many multiples. Oldenburg, uh, you know, did, he basically starts doing multiples with a store in 1961, 62, whenever that was. Um, uh, but, uh, or Jim Dine or um, whatever. Uh, so many of those pop artists got into it. But if you actually look at those artists' multiples, they're all pretty much handmade. You know, they're, pre you know, they're pretty, pretty much an artist making however many in their studio. Uh, what Keith did is he worked with the kind of cheap production things that were available to people. Um, the way that if you were doing a company and you wanted to slap your logo on things to give to your clients, those kind of things. So uh, it's, it's the evolution of the multiple to the product. And we live in kind of the time of products. I don't think I need to explain that part of the zeitgeist to any of you. So that, that's another huge thing. I think I'm pretty good on the, the history. What else should I say? Um, uh, you know, I guess I could go into music and fashion and, uh, but that's kind of, uh, it'd just be redundant at this point. So, um, I'm sorry DB's not here because I kind of love collectors. They, they drive me nuts. Don't get me wrong. They're, they're really like, they're way more dysfunctional than, than artists ever. Um, they've got so many pathologies, it's, it's, it's hard, uh, hard to really get into. But especially like collectors like DB, uh, uh, I've always, um, I've always had a real soft spot because they're not trying to collect blue chip paintings, um, which will find their way through the eye of the needle of history eventually anyway. Uh, when they collect ephemera, it, it, it kind of gets really interesting. And, and, and people do that forever. And if I start with Chiquita Bananas, one of the first things I remember like crazy money for was the stickers that would go on the crates of fruit. Uh, and that, so that goes back to the 19th century. But, you know, whether it's cigarette matches or shot glasses or, well, I should think of some other things other than my vices. Um, but uh, so, it, it, but they're really good. I, I, as, a, as a writer who needs to do research, they're incredibly handy. And as a curator who's always uh, tried really hard to in, include ephemera, uh, include kind of the quotidian uh, detritus that accumulates around our culture uh, and incorporate into shows are really helpful as well. Um, so we have to appreciate them because they're actually kind of saving uh, what's discarded. And, and, you know, if you think of Kurt Schwitters in Dada, uh, you, know, um, you know, he was like, well, I, I want to, you know, make art out of a loose button or <laughs> A, a ticket stub or whatever, all these pathetic things that are crying out to me with their history. Well, I mean, it's, it's kind of, you know, that art thing also translates to a lot of people who aren't, you know, don't think of themselves as artists. And I, uh, I found a lot of uh, odd creativities uh, within people's collections. There was a great uh, 
amazing uh, artist collective, uh, I guess early 80s uh, group material. Do you know the dates on that? No. But they, they did these great things where they, they would, yeah, they put artists in, but they'd also like talk to their Puerto Rican or Dominicano neighbors and be like, you know, give us something from your house. And you get like th this thing, a lot of people, uh, art's a really intimidating thing. It's a language that uh, uh, is, is difficult for people to grasp and they're made to feel pretty lousy uh, about their ignorance on it. But everyone uh, has these kind of resonances in them. So um, I, I, think, I think about that a bit. Um, and, and just, you know, the, uh, well, there's just a level of obsession. Now, what's a little problematic about it to me is this idea of what's kept pristine, the mint condition. And uh, before DB started his tick sticker collection, he used to collect uh, vinyl figure artist toys, um, which was a huge movement uh, and, uh, and sucked up a lot of oxygen and the knots, I think it was. And it's really where Cause for Brian uh, gets his start. Um, but lots of people, Ron English, I don't know, lots of people did these things. And these were basically, again, uh, a a technology makes something accessible for artists. So the normally prohibitive fabricating costs that would be associated with sculpture, or especially sculpture in multiple, uh, all of a sudden with this kind of uh, injection, like it's not in mold, it's like, it's, it's a way of scanning things or taking the file directly off a computer and then you can print it. This became a huge thing. Now DB is always one of these people who's like, I remember like, his son's only a couple of years younger than mine. I would be like, what do you mean? You don't let your kid play with the toys? And he's like, oh, no, no, that's his college fund. Well, <laughs> the problem with collectibles is that if everyone thinks they're a collectible, they all save them. And I saw the mainstream comic world, which thanks to Hollywood is now bigger than ever um, because we, we do need another superhero movie tomorrow. Um, the, what happened was, is like, I guess it was maybe early 80s, somebody's first action comics, which was like the first time Batman ever appeared. You know, someone had one like totally mint, like untouched, like somehow preserved in time. And it went up for auction and sold for like a million dollars, which is nothing now. I mean, we got way higher results for, uh, it, I don't know how much Michael Jordan's jersey just went for. I mean, there's a lot of stupid money uh, invested in nostalgia. But all of a sudden, every baby boomer in America, and that was a whole lot of them, they're dying off now. But they, for me growing up, it was like total tyranny. Um, but uh, they, they were all like, oh, I had that. My mom threw it away. So this idea, you know, and then... They, comic industry with the usual uh, farsightedness that we associate with all industries, they really jumped on it. And they, they, all of a sudden they were like, one comic would come out with five different covers and you had to get them all. But you had to get two, right? Because one, you had to keep seal up and in a dark space because, you know, of course it collapsed and the comic industry nearly died. The first uh, craze of collecting, does anyone know what that was? The first, you know, the, yeah, okay. It's a, uh, no, way before that. But baseball cards is great. And of course, like, uh, yeah, I think we just set a record for like a Hank Aaron rookie card or something. What? Mickey Mantle. Yeah, Mickey Mantle was the one? Okay. Uh, but the, the first one uh, was a, a long time ago before uh, we had American popular culture, which was the tulip bulb craze in Holland. And rich people, you know, because tulips became kind of like precious and exotic. And then like there were so many varieties and, and people would literally like buy tulip bulbs and hoard them and, you know, and try to re and they'd resell. And then, you know, grew up to crazy things where people were spending fortunes on tulip bulbs, uh, not growing them because, God, you know, God forbid you waste your tulip bulb on an actual flower. And, and then the industry collapsed and fortunes were lost. But so th there is a, a tricky thing with, with the nature of collectible, um, but uh, there's nothing wrong with personal collections. Like um, if you like snow globes, get them. 
you know, but you're probably never going to have the world's biggest snow globe collection. And, and, it, and it probably, you know, I don't know. <laughs> you all have computers on your phones. You can, you can look it up, see how much these things go for. I have no idea. Um, okay, and I think I talked a little bit about like the hand-drawn versus mass-produced. And I mentioned Martha's name, and then like most of the things I've been talking about, I, I forgot what it was about. Oh, I did tell you that she got rid of all of them, right? And, and only cares about the hand-drawn ones. Okay. Um, and then I guess one other thing that ties into this in terms of youth culture, and, and it's, uh, it's a pretty arcane one, but is custom culture. And uh, custom culture is something that ended up influencing the the art world a great deal there was a show called custom culture at mocha in la in the 80s um it's still a revered show and there's a lot of really famous artists who are in that show but that kind of came out of a hot rod culture after world war ii which is kind of a moment when youth culture really uh springs up in america though, though it, it exists beforehand um, beforehand, we could say kids were meant to be seen and not heard. Afterwards, we could say that kids were courted because they actually had disposable money and uh, they could kind of be magnets or strange attractors for new ideas. But so you had a whole generation of really uh, twisted, discontented guys coming back from the war, pretty damaged. Uh, we have a whole bunch of terms for that now, which we didn't back then, or we can understand as a psychological condition. Back then you were just kind of shell-shocked or something. But they were coming back and they were profoundly alienated from the America that they had left. And out of that, we have things like uh, motorcycles, the, the birth of the MCs, the motorcycle clubs, like Hell's Angels comes at that time. But one of the other things that happens in Southern California where they love to generate youth culture, um, and it kind of tied in with a, another newfangled musical sound called surf music, like you know, as in the Beach Boys, was uh, like the Beach Boys had My Little Deuce Coupe, which was about a car. Um, uh, and people would come back and car production in the United States had pretty much uh, wound down, like record production, like uh, uh, vinyl records, like a lot of things had wound down during the war because of the scarcity of materials everything precious and every bit of manufacturing had to go to this uh, beautiful beast we now have called the military industrial complex. But um, so, and then of course car production revs up when America's back and we've got all these people, it's a new moment of affluence and everyone's buying new cars and, and we can see the results of, of what Detroit wrought upon our uh, ecology because of that. But what you had was you had also these pretty poor people, uh, young uh, people just out of the war, um, who had incredible mechanical skills because they were fixing up bomber airplanes and stuff like that. They were actually like, you know, grease jockeys in their way. And they were buying the really old cars, the cars from before the, you know, from the golden age of the model, but like, like a Model T kind of thing. And they were chopping them down and they were rebuilding the engine and they started to decorate them. So there was this guy, Ed Big Daddy Roth, who was actually one of the first sticker guys because his competitor was this guy, Stanley Mouse, who back then was in Detroit. Roth was in Southern California. Um, and he, he hated Mouse because, uh, well, he wasn't a Mormon, which is what Ed Big Daddy Roth was. Uh, a Mormon alcoholic, a lovely combination of a man. Um, but uh, uh, he, he was his competitor and his name was Mouse. So he created something called Ratfink, which was huge, like Google it sometimes. This was like, uh, a, a, you know, there was Ratfink everything, but Ratfink stickers were really big. But customizing goes through, it's a way of like, it's a new way of negotiating our relationship to products. Now, my kid's 23 now. He's been, you know, he just graduated Cooper a year or two ago. So he's kind of generationally similar to you. And I'd say he's a label whore. You know, he'd kill me for saying that. But I mean, so much of identity is constructed by like 
<laughs> what you wear in that way. And, uh, and especially in a town of, uh, of affluence uh, as New York, it, it's, it's really ruthless. Uh, and the, boy, the guys, you know, it was always something that afflicted women more than men, but now, now the guys have it seemingly just as bad. But um, customizing kind of, I guess it's like, I'd give, it, I'd give that one, okay, you know, I can put it back on the 50s with car culture where you get someone doing a flame job on the side of a car, like these hot rods, these kind of, these, you know, these things to make your car unique in this forest of uh, uh, factory made uh, reproductions of themselves. Um, but in this, the hippies kind of like, you had kids like, you know, you know how hippies doodle, like when you're really stoned and you just start doodling and it gets kind of trippy looking and stuff. Well, they kind of do those on their jeans. And then people started getting into, not epaulets, what are those little metal studs you'd kind of, they do those or, you know people started kind of customizing their clothes, like adding fringe to it, things like that. Taking the, the store-bought, the quotidian, and somehow making it its own. Now, of course, you, uh, you know, like all things, it can be commodified, uh, even, even the personal touch. And so you can go to Nike, and they've got a template of like, you know, 80 things, 80 different choices you can make with like multiple choices on it. So you can have your sneaker built like, and then you could put your name on the side or something like that. Uh, so right now we're, we're basically in a culture of customizing, but there were a lot of artists like another SVA student uh, named Kenny Scharf, who's kind of a big artist now. He was all into custom culture and he would just take you know, it'd be like, oh, that doesn't work anymore. Can I have it? And then he'd just cover it with like, he'd glue little plastic dinosaurs to it and sequins or whatever like that. But it was this idea of, of customizing. So I think we, sh we can also think of stickers not just as unique objects, but as a weird way of representing um, the, the way I, I do, even though no one really ever looks at my notebook. It's this sort of... Um, it, 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 People just do that. And I think that's kind of part of human nature. I don't know if any of this made sense. Was, was that all right? I hope you have some questions because I don't know what I was talking about. So no questions, <laughs> stupid. <laughs> Thanks. Yo, yeah, please. What are some of your favorite uh, current street artists or different artists? Oh, okay. Um, I'm trying to think. You know, there's a wonderful show if you guys get a chance to see it, like literally down the street. I think it's on 21st. This place called Poster House. Does anyone know it? It's on 23rd. 23rd, okay, sorry. I still get lost in my hometown. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's... Uh, and I was really impressed because uh, some of those artists, had, like this guy Jordan Seiler, who's a real interesting political artist, and he's got this thing now with he's putting up phone booths around the city in different places where you pick up and so, so, you know, it's a way of conversing with people just randomly. Um, but he did a lot of like, uh, a lot of this stuff comes from anti-advertising um, that... Uh, I'd say like for my generation, for the writers who are, who are doing things on the trains and in uh, other public spaces, it was kind of coming out of an incredible sense of abandonment. The city was very much a black and white place um, and that like the trains were in Technicolor. Um, so it, it, it had that thing. I think right now, I don't know how you feel, but a lot of people respond to the fact that um, like most public space has been privatized, like the best seat in the park. You have to have a cappuccino to enjoy uh, that seat. Um, there's all these kind of like public-private uh, hybridizations. Which, but our visual landscape has really been bought and sold, and it's a really coercive, horrible place. So a lot of people are responding, I think, to um, this kind of really intrusive, uh, coercive uh, use uh, of their of their visual landscape um 
So the show at at Poster House is a, a lot of you know a, a lot of really interesting artists who are who are doing basically detournements or shredding. They're basically taking pre-existing ads and screwing with them um, in different ways. And uh, so I like a lot of that stuff. I'm not a hater on the muralists. Uh, a lot of my friends ended up doing that and they make a lot of money and I'm really happy for them because they're not outlaws. They're like, they, they like buy me dinner. Uh, <laughs> you know, they're doing good or, or give me a sticker or a t-shirt. No, but um, uh, you know, and that's tricky because uh, there's something called placemaking now, which is, uh, it's, it's way worse than gentrification, but it's like, I'm just gonna like wipe out that three block area in Brooklyn and I'm gonna build like its own little like kind of city and I'll have a coffee shop and a wine bar and a bookstore, whatever it takes to make people feel hip and urban. But I'll also commission a muralist to do that. So it's all, been, you know, and tourist people are, you know, muralism's a little tricky, but I, I still think there's some incredible people doing that just for scale, you know, and certainly like Os Gemios did some stuff in this neighborhood and these Brazilian the, the twins is what it means or twins. And, that stuff's incredible. I mean, I still like a lot of street artists. I'm not, it used to, you know, the street art, one of the big game changers was it was of course the internet. Um, uh, it used to be like, you kind of like, you were a locavore everywhere you were. And if you traveled, you got to see other people's stuff. But now uh, the documentation, the mediation of street arts become so big. And I don't really enjoy, uh, I have to spend enough time on my computer putting in my information as a writer that I don't take any pleasure from like surfing the internet and going to all the sites that have that stuff. But, um, so I'm not as up as I should be, honestly. Um, but there's like a really good local one for New York is BSA, Brooklyn Street Art. And they literally publish material every day. And they're, you know, really dedicated. They've been doing it, I think, over 10 years. It's kind of like, Fantastic, you know, it's kind of cool that way. So I, I check out that one a bit, but um, I, I like, you know, uh, I like the small things, the incidental things, the um, the people who haven't really necessarily found their voice yet. As I said, I kind of like the conversation more. I mean, there are masters out there and there's some really great artists and a lot of them like I mentioned Barry McGee earlier, who I think is in this show. I mean, he's like, you know, blue chip gallery kind of guy now. There's a lot of them have crossed over, but I kind of still like, you know, the way the kids are just off doing their own stuff. Who do you like? Um, Anyone? I have one. Oh, is he good? Uh, one of my friends is a uh, man. Sure, sure. I love those. Yeah. Super cool. They get up. Nice. Yeah, it's really great. It's like, I think it's kind of fun. Uh, um, we've been wanting to leave our mark uh, as a culture for a really long time. I mean, I would, the the most famous image of the moon landing, which I don't know if there's flat earthers here, but I think it happened. Uh, I watched it on TV as a kid, but. Uh, is actually not really just the American flag being planted there, is actually the first footprint on the moon. And then when the Mars Curiosity rover went over, it was actually its tire tracks was the most downloaded image. We like to see our mark, and this is where like petroglyphs and all sorts that we've been mark making for a really long time. So I think um, if you're an artist, you should uh, understand that this is kind of hardwired in our, uh, in our DNA, like an extra vertebrae, and you should care a lot about your mark. So that's cool you're doing that. Anyone else? I'm sorry, go ahead, man. Did you say something? Yeah, you want to? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I just wonder that, do you think that someday sneakers will be replaced by something else or just it, that's an interesting question. I, I, I only think, I think only fools predict the future. So I've been wary about ever doing that because <laughs> I, I'd probably be wrong. Uh, I was, Paper was one of the first magazine that ever had like a, uh, its own, you know, went digital. It was the first magazine that did that. And uh, so I had like one of the earliest email addresses before AOL existed. 
And like when they hooked me up with it, I wrote like breaker, breaker one nine, which meant that I thought it was going to be the CB radio. So I'm consistently wrong. Um, what, I, what I do think and I think is interesting and, and uh, you guys are going to have Ben Davis uh, talking uh, sometime as part of this series. And he's been really smart on NFTs because he refuses to be an old hater. He's been trying to give it um, uh, as much... Uh, um, as much bandwidth as he could, even though it's basically sometimes uh, it feels like shyster selling swamp land in Florida. Um, but uh, there is this thing about the dematerialization of art, uh, which is uh, definitely going on. And uh, I don't know if people will care about a JPEG in 50 years as much as they do about ephemera. Um, I do like know that my generation was the last one to have entire um, histories of our own ephemera, of our papers. And so we're all like kind of wooed by different universities all the time for like, can we have your shit? I don't know if people are gonna do that with, I know that a lot of people in archiving stuff are going for that. Uh, will, will uh, you know, I mean, if there's no more paper, <laughs> There will be no more stickers. I mean, if it's such a crisis that way, I have no idea. But um, will people feeling like they can make their mark in a virtual space uh, matter as much? I don't know. But then people want to save something. And I'm not sure the documentation matters that much. Um, there's been a lot of really great. I mentioned Martha Cooper, Henry Chalfont. There's a lot of it's a whole world of people documenting, for instance, these things that are happening on the streets now. Everyone loves their photos, but they don't really have much market value, even though I think they're really good uh, photographs uh, that you know you could get your Cartier-Bresson uh, decisive moment on. So I don't know. I think that like uh, as long as it's something tangible, that it, it will have some meaning and some resonance for people. What do you think? Yeah. I mean, I think part of the, the appeal of these things, um, and I'm sorry I brought it so much into street art and graffiti, though to me it does come a lot from that, is the ephemeral aspect of it. You're not just making your mark, but you're certainly not casting in bronze. You're, you're, you're willing to give it up to the buff, whether it is somebody not liking where it is, uh, all those stickers on the wall and taking a scraper and get rid of them, rid of them or so I'm painting over graffiti or uh, just the weather. I mean, part of what you're buying into is something which is less precious than maybe what you're creating in your studio practice. Um, so I think that's, that's part of what artists might be interested in embracing in this. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I think one of my favorite things about um, stickers in particular is just this whole like, oh, I was here too aspect. Yeah. And like, just the idea that like someone's gonna pass by something you did and then think of you, um, I think that's really nice. Like just that crossover in time. Oh yeah, for sure. And that's, that's kind of, you know, like uh, petroglyphs were very much conversations over generations. Like in Hawaii, you could, um, when a kid is born, you, you, you make a big kind of circle not a big one like that and you'd stuff the umbilical cord in there and then when their kid was born you'd make a ring around it you put that in you know and you can see them there'd be like 15 rings and these you know so this is like a whole other way of like marking time and space and i i don't know i um uh <laughs> I watched a really crappy movie uh, as we're all streaming too much movies. I, you're back in school, so I'm sure you're not doing that. <laughs> but it's called I Came By. It's on Netflix. It's like a British production. But it's about these graffiti artists who break into rich people's homes and, and do like incredible pieces on the wall, which basically say I Came By. And then it turns into like some gnarly, gruesome uh, murder mystery kind of thing. But uh, so but anyway, you know, basically that's it. I mean, if. The, the first way, uh, in terms of literally like merchandise being made, like little statuettes, all sorts of crazy thing. During World War II, um, the, there was something called Kilroy was here. 
And this is, and, and so this was where, and basically it was like a guy, it turns out, I know the guy who really did the research on it, Roger, and he, he found this guy, and I think he was like a bomb inspector uh, at like some munitions plant in like Philly or something. And he just right after he inspected the bomb, Kilroy was here. And then you'd have these, you know, these um, sometimes unexploded, whatever like that. And people would find them, and then all the soldiers around all the, Amer all, all the USGIs, they just started writing, Kilroy was here, they can't, you know, so. Uh, that that's is, I think similar to that. Uh, anyone else? Good. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I have a question. Um, yeah, I mean, you mentioned the the kind of anti-consumer um, aspect of a lot of this stuff, and I was you know I was thinking about that recently because uh, I think the anniversary of Occupy Wall Street was, mm -hmm. was the other day, and, and uh, you know, and, and that was actually a call right from Adbusters Magazine, um, so kind of 90s era uh, consumer, anti-consumer culture that then sort of passed away um, in a way. And I was just wondering, are there sort of lessons from this history? I mean, it seems like one lesson from history you're saying is basically like, you have to sort of keep running because the eternal power of commodification will like catch up to basically any <laughs> anti-consumer yeah. sort of effort. Um, but I wonder if there are also other Lessons you think, or... Yeah, I mean, uh, there, there is that bitter lesson that no matter how subversive you are, it will be co-opted and monetized in the end, no doubt. Uh, even the dematerialization of art that we experienced in the 60s uh, and, and threw into conceptual art or land art or all these things like that, which were meant to kind of defy that, gets co-opted. I think it's kind of, all these things are kind of constantly evolving and they really have to do with the ingenuity uh, uh, of youth. And, and the ways of trying to get around these things. Uh, flash mobs uh, has been a great one. Uh, and, and in a sense, like Occupy Wall Street was one big elaborate flash mob. Um, but uh, product drops is another really weird one. So this would be like, imagine, I think of records because I remember like banks he did some and Ron English did where basically you kind of like you shoplift a record and then you go home and you you do something else in there or you create a fake probably you, you know create like a, a, a fake Taylor Swift record with like really gruesome and you slip it into the store <laughs> right so I mean there's all you know, and these things are like I don't know how practical they are but like uh Everything is, uh, you know, any way that you can stop people for one second in their tracks and not even give them an answer, but just make them question what they're looking at, um, I think is really healthy thing to do in a rather blinkered uh, society where so much of our mental health and well-being is determined by kind of what we can afford. Um, so I think it's just about the query and I, and I trust that other strategies come about. Is that, is that what you were asking about? Uh, I'm, and I'm sure that, you know, there's others. I mean, there were people like, uh, I don't know, maybe this uh, hardware got too sophisticated or I'm not seeing it as much, but these kind of electronic billboards you see everywhere, there are people hacking them and doing like distortions on them or putting in other material. I mean, I think that, um, it, the the commons you know which is which is public space is always got to have like the heckler it's like it's always got to have like these other voices and, and i think that now that our commons is like is, is kind of a visual landscape it it, it it's going to be more artists and polemicists i think who can um who can interrupt uh and, and derail these things Are we good? Okay, thanks a lot, everyone. <laughs>